today we've hit the top of the mountain with this facility, five-star hotel, first one in the city, I think one of the few in the Commonwealth. So this is a big deal for tourism in Virginia Beach. The hotel is entrenched into the very fabric of the community of the city of Virginia Beach. Uh, we got literally hundreds of letters from people up and down the East Coast that had stayed at the hotel, but a lot of them from residents in the city of Virginia Beach asking us to save, to make sure we saved uh, the hotel. The whole of this hotel are really to, to bring back a, uh, a grand experience in Virginia Beach, something that doesn't exist in this market and really is a, is a rare uh, experience in the country with something this spectacular uh, here in Virginia Beach to really add a new element and a uh, basically filling a gap of a, of a product that uh, Virginia Beach didn't have in this historic elegance. One of the um, uh, stories that people love to tell about the hotel is all the great celebrities and the big galas that used to take place. Every president from 1930 to 1965 stayed here. Uh, we've taken all of their pictures, the presidents, the celebrities, sports stars, reframed them, and we have um, adorned all of our hallways with uh, those pictures and portraits of, of those folks as well as a little factoid about uh, their experience here in the hotel. The Raleigh Room, the signature room, or the living room of the hotel, has been reimagined, recreated exactly the way it was architecturally, but with a new flair and a contemporary flair. Down in the Hunt Room, which uh, has its grand fireplace that's been uh, the hallmark of the hotel for years, for we've added a distillery adjacent to it, a little nod back to the Prohibition days that the Cavalier was famous for. Immediately across from those two establishments is the Sea Hill Spa, the Grand Pool, and the uh, Fitness Center. This hotel has always been an icon, it came very close to being demolished. And to see it being restored today uh, with basically nothing left undone and knowing that it has such a great bright future, I cannot begin to tell you how happy I am. And, I look forward to being successful for many, many years to come and for many generations to enjoy. This is exactly what I had envisioned it would be. I'm hoping that it becomes the iconic uh, Grand Dame for the region that it has been for years. The Mille Colori, Italian for a thousand colors, is the sole piece of art in the Virginia Museum of Contemporary Art that remains on display year-round. Dale Chihuly, often called the world's greatest living artist, created the glass chandelier in 1996 along with 14 others and placed them under bridges across the Venetian canals as a tribute to the Biennale Aperto Vitro. Believe it or not, the Chihuly acts like a giant Rorschach inkblot. Everyone sees something different in it. When the Virginia Museum of Contemporary Art purchased this colorful work back in 2003, the Rodriguez Pavilion was built specifically to house the Chihuly. The piece is 14 feet tall, 8 feet wide, weighs over one ton, an estimated 2,200 to 2,500 pounds, and is made of 520 blown glass objects. The glass is attached to a metal frame or armature. The shapes resemble horns, split leaves, water drops, and goosenecks. Together, they form a large cone shape extending downward to a point barely above visitors' heads. Dale Chihuly was born in 1941, was first introduced to glassmaking while studying interior design at the University of Washington, and founded the Pilchuck Glass School in 1971. Utilizing the teamwork approach, Chihuly paints his ideas on paper, and other talented glass blowers create the glass objects. The Mille Colorie was nicknamed End of the Day, referring to the practice of Venetian Renaissance glassblowers melting the day's scraps together to make one last work of art. I think that you all would make Dr. Seuss, who wrote this book, very, very proud. This kicks off National Read Aloud Month, which is the month of March. So the celebration today is just to bring everybody together to share their love of reading with books. You can think about snubs. 
Reading is critical um, to kids' future success in school, and reading is important at birth. And so we're trying to connect children, families, community members, um, celebrities, child care providers, and just get everyone together to share that love of reading. And what would you do if you met a Jabu? I fully believe in the importance of reading to children. I'm very, very passionate about reading to children. From the day my son was born, my husband and I read to him. And I believe that if you start reading to a child when they're very young, they associate reading with love and comfort. We want them to share the love of reading. We want them to see adults who love reading and we just want them to be encouraged and really love books. Reading is, is so important to their future life success and, and um, education and in the workforce and it sets the stage for future learning. So we want them to see adults who love reading, we want to share the love of books and really just highlight the importance of it. Oh, the things you can think up if only you try. If you try, you can think up a guff going by. Their eyes light up, they smile, um, they get chattery, they, you know, you can see them get amped up and they're ready for the next page, especially when you're reading Dr. Seuss because it's so much fun. And I also think that it's a really great thing for parents to do with their children because you're sitting next to your child reading that book together and it's really a special bonding moment. Think a race on a horse on a ball with a fish. Everybody It makes me feel happy. She, um, she likes it when I pet her. Like, I'm putting this smile on my face. It was such a good fit for me, uh, since I work in the library, and it's such a good thing for children to read. They need that all through life, their skills, helping them in school and stuff. So I thought that would just be so much fun, and to have a dog that you could work with, because I just love dogs. So that's why I wanted to get it started. I work with Virginia Beach Public Libraries and I've worked at the Great Neck Branch for 31 years. Well, once a month, Lori comes in on a Friday, that's her day off at the library, and the kids are excited. They know exactly when their Peyton's coming that week, and we make dog biscuits, we go to the garden, we uh, read a book, and the kids are so social and they're so good. When Peyton comes, he makes such a big difference. I do feel more comfortable with dogs, but I'm not really afraid of Peyton that much. Peyton is a good dog, and um, they, they want to do tricks. Well, she loves to be around people, but she also gets cookies that those children make for her, and she loves those cookies. <laughs> When we go in there, I usually talk with them a lot. They're pet and Peyton. They're asking me what I've been doing, or they tell me what they've been doing. So I hope in that way that helps them. The children are always excited when we come into the classroom. They like to meet Peyton. They enjoy reading to us. And, um, and reading builds up their self-confidence. And dogs are non-judgmental, so they think that's fun to read to her. And you know, it doesn't matter how they read to her, it's all fun. And when they're happy, that just makes me happy. I can be having a bad day, and I'm not having a bad day anymore after I go in and visit with the children. The Interfaith Forum, moving from charity to change, uh, effective ways to address homelessness, was an opportunity to move from the housing ready to the housing first model of addressing homelessness. So the housing first philosophy is uh, the philosophy based on every citizen is um, has a right to housing and that they don't need, that they are housing ready wherever they are in their life and that putting a person in housing um, and wrapping uh, services around them to support them is what people need when they're homeless um, because when you're homeless what you need is a home and so you put them in housing first and then you support them um, to, to encourage them and help them keep that home. 
So from a faith-based community perspective, how can we help people not just in terms of getting their basic needs met today, but how can we be an active member in that journey from homelessness and survival to being housed and increasing stability and reintegrating back into a community where I have a sense of autonomy, but also a sense of I am connected to other people and I am a member of this community. So the Community of One effort is the uh, city's 10-year plan to end homelessness that was adopted in October of 2017 by the City Council. And it is the plan to make uh, homelessness rare, brief, and non-recurring in the city of Virginia Beach. We need to be coming up with new ways. We need to value collaborations and partnerships. I do believe under the city leadership, the Housing Resource Center is a wonderful opportunity to I believe be an integrated and groundbreaking. So there's the recognition with the adoption of Housing First that perfectly imperfect people can be successfully housed. Housing is a right and that from the safety and dignity of home things become much more possible in the way of improving our wellness, improving our stability, improving our productivity and our inclusion in the community. People can become involved in the community effort in one of three ways. Um, the Housing Resource Center will have volunteer opportunities. Beach Community Partnership, which is a partnership of the faith community and providers in the city of Virginia Beach. And people can connect through the initiatives at the IAB to connect um, in helping. This is an annual program that Cape Henry Rotary has, and it is to honor the public safety employee and volunteer of the year. This is one of the most special programs that we have. Everyone looks forward to it, and we are honored to be able to have these individuals here. Our community is very fortunate to have Susan Bauman as a Virginia Beach volunteer paramedic. She's a superhero who routinely goes above and beyond her assigned duties as a member of Virginia Beach Rescue Squad which she joined in 2002. And it always amazes me that we're able to get people to volunteer for that many years. And, uh, and, and my hat's off to you, Susan. Thank you for everything you do. I've been doing this now for 16 years, and it just feels wonderful to be acknowledged for the work that you love to do. I'm extremely fortunate. My duty partner is my husband of 50 years, so we work together. We enjoy what we do and we feel good at the end of a shift when we've assisted people. Thank you all very much. I know this is the first time you've awarded uh, this particular accolade to a group and I want you all to rest assured that you can sleep at night knowing that you probably have the most dedicated, professional, uh, incredible group of detectives that are employed by the Virginia Beach Police Department. And I'm absolutely proud and honored to be their supervisor. Thank you very much. Do we all have our hands up? Yes. Markers down? The answer is Sunday, August 13th. The Battle of the Books is a game show style competition for fifth graders and they read 10 book titles and compete on trivia questions about those books. The purpose of the um, competition is to get kids excited about books and reading, to get them to work in a social group around the love of books and reading. The first year we had about six teams in the competition, and this year we had 100. Take a deep breath in. You finished round one already, deep breath out. I learned that I can put forth more effort than I imagined, because I thought Battle of the Books, I would just like answer the questions, be nervous and stuff. But Battle of Books has helped me become proud, brave, and get more interest in books. Sandy and Dennis with a Y. The amount of work that she's put into it has created like a work ethic towards text and literature that I hadn't seen in her yet, that I didn't know was achievable in her age. I'm pretty sure she would think that it's also been an exciting journey and well worth it. In Save Me a Seat, fill in the blank. I think reading is fun. Storytelling is fun. Not just fun, it's important. Events such as these, focuses back on the important art of storytelling. I think the human race has come forward because of that, because every writer writes to tell a story that is important. Take your time, take the whole minute. What I really hope is that these kids leave with that love and passion for reading, that even though schoolwork might get hard, that they keep reading for fun and they carry this with them through the rest of their lives.
Located at 1113 Atlantic Avenue, the DeWitt Cottage is the only surviving 19th century cottage at the oceanfront. This two-story house of the late Victorian period exhibits a high degree of architectural and historical integrity. Constructed in 1895 for Bernard Peabody Holland, the first mayor of the town of Virginia Beach and his wife Emily, it is said that the open cupola feature on the cottage roof was used by Holland as an observatory for waterfowl on the lakes behind the house. After a while, Emily grew annoyed at the sound of waves crashing on the beach, so Holland sold the house to Cornelius DeWitt. After Cornelius and his wife died, the house became known as the DeWitt Cottage, as the DeWitt family continuously occupied the cottage until January of 1988. Hey, I'll take some of these nuts and how about some of that DeWitt Cottage cheese I've been hearing so much about? <laughs> we, we've got plenty of peanuts, <laughs> but no cheese. The City of Virginia Beach and the Virginia Beach Foundation acquired the DeWitt Cottage in 1990 and agreed to rehabilitate the building. Wonderful ambiance. Right, boy? Since the completion of the restoration in 1995, the DeWitt Cottage currently operates as the Atlantic Wildfowl Heritage Museum, featuring exhibits and artifacts from the region's wildfowling history. The DeWitt Cottage is open to the public five days a week, seven days a week, from Memorial Day through September. This evening is a public workshop uh, to take input on the collective projects of the Entertainment District. Uh, the Entertainment District is uh, part of the Central Beach uh, Resort area, and we have projects that are going to bring opportunity for year-round tourism and destination for both locals and tourists alike. I just felt it was really important that instead of looking at each project individually, that we have an opportunity to look at all of it together and see how it's going to work together. I want to put as much money as possible from into the general fund and into our schools, but also recognize that this place isn't going to grow if we say no to everything. We want everybody to have an opportunity to talk and to provide input, and it's valuable when you can have a conversation. Of course, at this point, we can't answer everybody's questions, but if we wait until we've got all the answers, then it's too late for them to really have input. So it's important that we do it early in the process so people can give us their ideas. And I think we've, we've heard a lot of really good ideas that can probably be incorporated. I've been involved with like the ping pong tournament that's done for Charity at the Fieldhouse and other things out there. It's very well utilized. Um, so I think if the studies show that there's a capacity for that, especially drawing other people into the area for the weekend kind of tournaments and stuff, I think that's a, that's a great draw and it's a perfect place to put it. All of these projects have uh, a recommendation for capital investment and the city managers introduced budget uh, that will come on March 27th. My name is Alani. I live in Virginia Beach. I go to Princess Anne Elementary School. This is my talker. IT helps me speak. Leilani led that change. We followed her lead with this. Um, she showed a lot of um, ability and progress using the previous device. Um, she showed some literacy skills. She was reading. Um, and using that information, um, we thought it'd be a good idea to transition to something um, more advanced for her. Yeah, I think the device has leveled her playing field to where we get to see what she really has to say and what she knows. She's definitely demonstrating a level of comprehension uh, that's equal to, to her peers. Um, it's just, just kind of an amazing thing. We just didn't know what was, what, what was in there. And now that she can communicate and, and show us what, uh, what she's thinking, it's, uh, it's pretty cool. We have story time in my classroom and she'll bring up her device and read stories to the other students, mm -hmm. which are, you know, on different lower mm -hmm. levels than she is. It's just fascinating to see her do that. When she participates in small group lessons, um, she answers the questions, she uses her uh, Chromebook, as well as her eye gaze machine to 
uh, read whatever passages we're working on, um, and she'll interact you know, with the other students in the group as they answer questions as well. Uh, just because a child has a disability, it doesn't mean that they're not very aware of what's going on around them. Um, just because the output is different than you or me, um, but by giving them that assistive technology to, to level that playing field. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of kids that would benefit from this, so it just helps us to kind of keep our eyes open uh, for those opportunities. She's only had this device since October, and in that amount of time, she's been able to locate and remember the location of specific vocabulary and, and use it in context appropriately, and a lot of it has been self-taught just by working on her own and practicing with the device, so that's pretty incredible to see. I think everybody in this building wants to see Leilani succeed, um, and that goes down to the kids. You know, um, there's as she's going through the hallways, um, kids are constantly uh, saying hi, Leilani. They, they want to hear her speak to them uh, with her device. Everybody, everybody's just been very supportive, um, and that's just kind of the, the nature of our building. Everyone in the cafeteria, they come up to hi, Leilani. How you doing? <laughs> she shares. She, everyone and our school community knows mm -hmm. Leilani. Mm -hmm. Strange. Thing. I think it gives her an opportunity to be like any other non-disabled peer. Um, just to see her be able to tell her mom, I love you with that device or say good morning to someone, to say something awesome. Teaching and learning are reciprocal and, and she has probably taught me far more than I could teach her. Mm -hmm.